most uh, kind of familiar to everybody, and uh, all, I expect that everybody has wondered about this question at one time in their life. So I, I guess you know everybody has some opinion about this, uh, uh, unlike the uh, last two uh, sessions. So please look at that Shin at any time and uh, ask uh, for clarification or uh, make some comments. Please. Okay, so uh, this is debate number three, and uh, it's about free will. Uh, we have been uh, discussing very intensively from the morning, and everybody's tired. So if you want to step out, take your iPhone, or just take a nap, feel free to do so. It's your free will. <laughs> um, and um, uh, it seems like I'm the only person who wants to present, and uh, I have to squeeze in 30 minutes, and then happen, and uh, I have also may have something to say. Uh, I would like to start my talk with something that I'm not going to talk about, and that is the relationship between free will and consciousness. And it's a big topic, and I, I don't know why. So now I suddenly came up with this idea of uh, you know, having a debate on free will, and I kind of raised my hand, but it's unclear what the exact relationship between free will and consciousness. We can talk about uh, awareness of sense of free choice, maybe related to sense of agency or you know, whatever it is, but intention maybe? Can, uh, uh, I'm not sure about uh, you know, like uh, people who study motor system, but uh, to me, free will is sort of the mirror image kind of the question of the motor side of the consciousness. That's one of the reasons. Is it fair to say that or? So as I said, I'm not going to talk about it, so okay. you guys will discuss later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what I'm going to talk about is much, much more uh, strict, and this is the uh, focus. So, where neural determinism, which I will define later, but it's obvious to you, exercise, meaning el eliminating free will. Okay? So, let's say neuroscience uh, will advance in infinitely. And uh, you figure out everything about action. Does that eliminate free will? And since now I really like uh, voting, let's do yeah. three or the first choice. Uh, do you think yes? You can raise your hand. Will it eliminate? So the okay. meaning that, that we don't have any free will. After, you yeah. know, it's fully accounted by neuroscience. Okay, uh, several, oh, quite a few, all right. So that's, in my definition, yeah. So that doesn't mean that the sense of free will or free will itself. Uh, I, I, I don't know the difference between them. Uh, when I have a sense of free will, then I do have free will. Yeah, at least that's the simplest thing. And I think if you raise your hand, then I think it's... Uh, so that's mainstream, I think. So you are a real neuroscientist if you raise your hand. Now, if, how, how about raise your hand if you don't think neuro, neuroscience will eliminate free will, okay? In this yeah, so that's, that's uh, okay, if you raise your hand, you are real deep thinkers. <laughs> now, the third option is, um, okay, I don't, I don't want to answer, or it depends what you mean by that. <laughs> okay, uh, you are opportunistic. Okay, of course, of course. I don't believe the term is itself. Oh, I see. Ah, okay, that's very good. I, I forgot. Okay, so my answer is yes and no, but mostly uh, no. Meaning that the no matter how your neuroscience is uh, going towards reductionism, determinism direction, your uh, sense of free will will survive. That's my conclusion. Okay, so the center of all my neuroscience seems to me, and I talked with my colleagues, that all mental experiences or mental phenomena that you experience uh, have neural correlates. And the strong version is that, that neural correlates causally. Uh, create your mental phenomenon. And this seems to be accepted. But if that's the case, and even the voluntary will is not an exception to this central dogma, and that's again mainstream opin opinion, then uh, don't you have to worry about you know the social system uh, depending on this free will uh, concept. So neural correlates not only precede mental experiences but actually causes them, then uh, if causally determined by preceding neural processes, then it's not a free. And then if it's not a free choice of free action, then you cannot be responsible. And then, you know, all the criminal system and all the other social systems are uh, just broken. So that's the concern. I want to call this neuroscientific determinism or reductionism. I'll give you some examples like Benjamin Nibet's study. But basically, 
even the most voluntary uh, action or decision that you made uh, with this full sense of freedom is predetermined by your neural activity. So that's neural determinism, reductionism. So that would cause an ethical crisis, or may not, but people worry that this kind of crisis of social system we have to give to punishment, responsibility, etc. Okay. Um, move on. So can neuroscience hold the other dimension above? And our sense of feeling of independence and freedom be compatible or not? So that's my question, focus, and then I would like to say yes, it's compatible. Now, there's something, I should skip this slide, but there's something really peculiar about free will uh, in our uh, daily concept because often people uh, make free will and a necessity or necessary causality in the opposite direction, like physical mechanics are like, you know, necessity, but free will is kind of opposite. But sometimes people also in a different context uh, put a free will against the accidental. So, you know, dice you throw, it's accidental. Even number, odd number, it's accidental. But it's not that dice has free will. So it's the opposite. But wait a minute, so accidental and necessity are kind of uh, logically opposite concepts. So where, where is free will sitting there? So it's a very peculiar concept. Also, uh, spontaneous and voluntary are usually considered as purposive. But uh, the purposive behavior sometimes is contrasted with spontaneous and voluntary decision. So which is the case of a purposive action, a purposive decision, is it equivalent to spontaneous and voluntary or it's opposite of spontaneous and voluntary? Right, so if, it, okay, I, if I go to the cafeteria with my hungry stomach then I eat a lot. But that's not my voluntary intention, I have to stop because I'm gaining weight. So in that case, it's the opposite. But if I go to the cafeteria with my empty stomach, I haven't eaten for the last three days, I keep eating. So that's like a purposive, spontaneous equal. So what's going on there? There are lots of other things like physical constraints, or biological, social constraints. I would like to make the point that usually the top view is typical papers. I have options physically for these. Uh, actions, but I would like to choose because of biological or social constraints. Uh, I will argue later, somewhat giving some points to higher level cognitive construct idea of consciousness, that perhaps biological or even social constraints precede those biological uh, constraints. Okay, so there are various, uh, many, many philosophers, professional philosophers in this room, so I, I hate to say this, but various philosophical attempts to say really from physical neurodeterminism. Uh, like compatibilism or dualism, to name a few, and it didn't seem to be very, very decisively successful. And the modern concept of freedom, and this is kind of important point, the modern concept of freedom has only a very short history. And it turned out that in terms of sociology, the history of legal systems, it turned out that it's retroactively constructed from the legal necessity of accountability or responsibility. And there are, you know, very heavy study by social psychologist named uh, Kozakai, who is based in Paris, I believe, and I also uh, reviewed this. But how about Erasmus? Okay, uh, who, I don't know about uh, Erasmus. What he, I know him, but I don't know what he said about free will. Uh, he wrote a book about the free will. Okay, uh, maybe that uh, in terms of the social system, uh, it's accepted as a you know part of the legal. A rule or you know code principles maybe very late but maybe early concept might oh, be yeah. Yeah, so we, we, we can talk about this later. Uh, so just to refine that my last point, uh, a lot of people argue that the necessity to draw a fine line between being account accountable or responsible versus not accountable for own action came from criminal legal necessity and especially you know this uh, I didn't know about this Latin word, non compos mentis, which is shin shin kojak in Japanese, or feeble mindedness. Those are uh, sort of uh, escape from uh, responsibility. But how do you decide that they don't have freedom, therefore they're not responsible? So those are relatively new necessity at the social, uh, social system level. So some argue that the free will concept has been developed just as a predominant fiction in criminal legal theories. This is a very strong uh, claim, and I'll be back again to this message with this statement that 
social influence or cognition can easily be becoming perception by training and cultural imprinting. Okay, so now, uh, section two, uh, I'd like to uh, describe what's really the basis of this New York de determinism and reductionism, and it's mainly Benjamin Levet's work and his uh, colleagues' work later. Uh, I might be able to skip this slide, these slides, but at the same time, some of you are not neuroscientists. So basically, um, this readiness potential has been known for many years, uh, almost half a century, and it's basically about uh, the neural activity before the action. The M is the movement timing, the, this is the time scale, and the, uh, this readiness potential starts very, very early, like sometimes more than one second earlier. And then, you know, this is also prior to the conscious onset of the will. And, you know, of course, this is highly controversial uh, technique used by Benjamin Levet to measure the onset time of the conscious will. And it's sort of sitting somewhere in between here, and readiness potential is way earlier than that. So, it seems like this is the initial sign in the neuroscience that we will maybe at the risk of disappearing. Uh, uh, this is the results of the Brevet study, and he is made. So basically, his task is to have fingers, and then you know, you, you are, if you are subject, then you choose the timing to raise your finger or not, and it's entirely up to you. And he categorized post hoc ways. Uh, readiness potential one and readiness potential two. One is where the action was planned within a crude range of timing. And in that case, readiness potential has uh, the onset time ranged from minus 800 to minus 1000 milliseconds towards the of muscular activity. Now, RP2 is much more a random trials where it's not planned, but all of a sudden there's an urge to raise your finger and then you raise your finger. In that case, still, uh, the readiness potential has peaked around the minus 550 milliseconds relative to the onset of the um, uh, finger movement. So, you know, approximately 700 milliseconds uh, earlier, there's a neural activity already started, so uh, and it's even been more conscious awareness of the will. So these are typically cited as, you know, the evidence for your, even your reaction is not exception to the rule that anything you experience mentally or your body is uh, sort of controlled and preceded by the neural activity. This is the later study by um, Patrick Haddad, actually collaborated with Benjamin Levant, and they uh, again used this early wheel trial, late wheel trials, so planned versus unplanned. But either way, it's all minus, meaning that, uh, uh, by the way, they're using lateralized left hemisphere, right hemisphere, separate then it's potential than just general potential, potential and it's correlated better with the, uh, this conscious concept of the will. But either way, causal research seems to me the neural activity first, and then this emergence of the will at the conscious level. So even the most free and spontaneous decision is preceded by the neural correlating activity. So it's seemingly, at least seemingly, argues for neural determinism, the seemingly depriving freedom from the human, I have to keep saying, seemingly, seemingly. Yet the human has freedom to suppress its urge to act, and indeed has sufficient time to do so. And this was Benjamin Levet's idea of saving free will from his own findings, in my interpretation. I actually translated his book to Japanese, and then I, I learned this. Later, I talked to Patrick Hara, his collaborator, great collaborators, and see if why did he try so hard to save free will from uh, his own findings? And uh, I said, was there a religious background? And Patrick told me that uh, he's probably American Jewish, and there may be some Jewish cultural value system there, so that he you know, found this you know, readiness potential, and he found that there's something wrong there ethically, and he's trying very hard to rescue uh, you know, this free will by human's ability to suppress it, veto the action. But, of course, that action of vetoing itself has neural codes preceding and determining causally, so it doesn't work, in my opinion. Okay? Uh, and uh, so that's the introduction, it's very brief, so if you ask me questions, I will uh, explain more now, and you can help me. But uh, this is the core part that I really want to push today. I do think there are three reasons why neural reductionism or neural um, determinism won't 
will not eliminate the sense of agency or the feeling of uh, free decisions. And I have a paper, and I fully describe this, so if you want, you can go back to this paper, but the first reason is the following. The feeling of free choice may live in the post-predictive process, not in the predictive process. And uh, this term post-diction came from visual psychophysics, and uh, it's not in the English Webster dictionary, but it's created by near scientists. And I have to probably explain what this is. And I gave actually, uh, in last year neuroscience, I gave a plenary lecture on this, but basically, perception, decision, action, it doesn't matter. 99% uh, neuroscientists are studying this predictive process before it happens, and they try to predict. And of course, there are three meanings of prediction, as Hakon nicely summarized in one slide. But my argument is that this uh, sensation or feeling of free will mostly coming from post-predictive process rather than a predictive process. Usually when you think whether your choice is free will or not, you probably uh, use uh, retrospective uh, analysis. So for example, I always take coffee, 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 and I never ask why it's my free choice or not, it's just my taste. One day I had too much coffee, so let's say just um, the British tea, please, and then my close friends ask me, what happened to you? I mean, you are a coffee drinker, you choose British tea today. And I retrospectively reconstruct, um, hmm, maybe it's just coffee uh, uh, just makes my uh, stomach a little too sick. Uh, so maybe today I will try just tea. And it's post hoc reasoning, but then you are consciously aware that it's free will of yours. So something like that is happening. And I can start from very perceptual example, microscopic uh, example of uh, post-fiction in the uh, Apparent motion, and this is just classical apparent motion. So the principle of Edison's movie. So just fix it in the middle, and then you're jumping left, you're jumping left, you're jumping right, and when it's slow, then it's very, you know, it's no jumping. But this is already in an apparent motion effect, the circuit is positive. Do you understand why? Because your brain doesn't know which way it goes. Initial stimulus in the middle. I drew computational lines and make it to the left or right. Your brain doesn't know. There's no prediction to interpret. Only when the second brain, the second object is given to the brain, your brain finally is capable to interpret trajectory. But it's not the real, that's not time sequence you perceive things, right? It's not. If you see the first dot, you see the second dot in the left or right, and then you see the trajectory. No. You see the first dot smoothly moving left or right to the second position, right? So that's already post-dictive. Backward masking is post-dictive, and the term of post came from a little more refined modal phenomenon called the flashlight effect, but either way, in terms of music and perceptual awareness, a conscious percept seems to be the product of post reconstruction. Uh, so when I published this paper, there are lots of religious fanatic people uh, called me and write me emails and said, you are the first solid neuroscientist proving that causality in science is wrong. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> so what I'm saying is this, right? So there's an early stimulus and late stimulus, and then there's new processing time period, and then finally you have awareness of the early stimulus. But in this relatively long, simply 100 milliseconds of neural processing to bring this early stimulus to the consciousness threshold, of course there's enough time for the late stimulus to have causal influence on this process. So there's nothing mysterious like religious or anything. Okay? And uh, this is again initially proposed account for the flashback effects, but actually has much broader applications and implications, including cognitive cases and action cases that I will discover uh, uh, later. So there are a bunch of uh, examples from classical to modern psychophysical phenomenon, phenomena, and also the cognitive uh, level post like constant updating stimulus, uh, short-term memory, causal misattribution, uh, memory distortion. So this is famous, right? Loftus and Loftus study cognitive psychology. Like if you are witness, you are uh, called upon in your police and you report what you saw, and this report itself influences your memory, and the next time, your memory is very, very distorted without conscious awareness of distortion, and then your certainty level doesn't go down. So you're very, very convinced that this is exactly what I saw, but you know, it could be wrong. Okay, so this is tens of milliseconds. This hindsight, well-known in social science, 
can be a matter of uh, long-term memory over months. So I argued in this my crazy lecture in the Yonsan's um, meeting that um, even though it's starting from teens Mexican to the scale of years, this is probably functionally uh, the most fundamental functional principle that the brain has. Even though the mechanism, of course, is different, it doesn't have scales. Uh, this is interesting in terms of free choice to me, and with regard to the position, uh, this is uh, the famous case of choice blindness by Peter Johansson and his colleagues. So they did a uh, total force choice of uh, face attractiveness judgment, and they used the trick. So uh, whenever the subject chooses one face as more attractive, and in most cases, uh, the experiments show that chosen face and then ask, why did you choose this face? And you know, let's say this is a male student subject, or female faces, one was chosen, and the student typically said, well, this face looks more like my mom. And then I like long hair, and this face has long hair, stuff like that. But to 10 to 15 percent of trials, randomly, the experimenter presented the unchosen face and said, okay, you just choose this, tell me why. Okay, the surprising finding number one, people often don't realize that it's not chosen face. The surprising finding number two, they have no problem giving uh, reasoning why it's chosen to non-chosen face. <laughs> you understand? Okay, so the post-addictive justification of the choice is entirely detached, almost entirely detached, uh, from the actual process, predictive, implicit process to choose whichever. Now, it's not true though. I mean, 30, maximum 30% of trials, they spot it. The subject said, no, 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 you made a mistake, I've chosen this one. But the majority of trials, they don't even notice, and the majority of trials, they don't even have program giving the reason why they've chosen this. Because it's very interesting positive reconstruction. So, choice blindness is based on positive and explicit reasoning. And just from extending from this, you can even argue that certain type of consciousness may be a positive and upon necessity, upon necessity reconstruction. Upon necessity, what I mean is that whenever asked by yourself or whenever asked by somebody else, you reconstruct it, and that's sort of consciousness. Uh, I'm not uh, giving a detailed account of my own work with uh, Kaduta Nakumura, but we have this suspicion one year that you know this athlete's success might be also positive. <laughs> So you know, as you may know, you know, they, they, you have a hat trick, soccer player, professional soccer players, they have hat tricks, and then when interviewed, you say, well, you know, I knew from this morning, this play is very special for me, and I was really perfect energy from the morning. Well, but this interview was done after the outcome, right? So is it post-directive reconstruction of prediction? But it's real prediction of prediction. And our results really clearly show that two thirds of athletes recreate their prediction memory, distorted towards to be consistent with the outcome. So when you win, you won, then you say, well, you know, I had a very good feeling in the morning. And when you are miserably lost, then you say there's something wrong with me, my body, or something like that. So, of course, they are asked questions twice. In the morning before the actual game, and within 24 hours, post hoc question about the prediction in the morning. So you, those are well aware of inconsistency, if you want, but they still distort the memory without knowing it. So it's very, very convincing, strong, powerful, positive reconstruction. Benjamin Levet himself came up with this uh, example to explain why, in his terminology, backward referral uh, is necessary for them. So imagine that you were driving in the night road. There was a small kid suddenly running in front of your car. And then you hit the brake, just barely enough to save the boy's life. Now, if you think about neural delay, the reflexive response can be executed in 150 milliseconds. It's very quick. But awareness of the visual stimulus, what is it in the dark uh, environment? It's the small kid, human being, because 300 to 400 milliseconds, but not to pass it as delayed from response. In other words, if you ask yourself, or somebody asks yourself, you say, well, what happened first is that I saw the baby, I, I saw the kid. And then I was very upset and hit the, uh, the brake. And then finally it stops and just barely saved the kid. That's the causal sequence to your report, and that's your query 
in a way. But it's the fact is that it's reconstructed in, and shuffled in the order of seekers. Right? So this happens a lot in daily life. Uh, by the way, uh, if you ask very good uh, Olympic athletes, like 100 meter dash, some of them are very careful, Fernandologists, and said, well, in my best condition, my legs start moving before I hear the start sound. And that's probably more accurate. But other people report not that way. Okay, I was trying very tuned up and I hear the sound immediately when I hear that I just start. Right? So that's reconstruction of the time sequence. Okay, so you can argue that perception and also action uh, revise the history. And you can also consider human as a quick zombie, so called, plus a slow analyzer or speculator, something like that. Implicit part, explicit part. Uh, there's some uh, other studies from Professor Stilian to the finger movement, and in this case, uh, the experimenter asked the subject to uh, raise fingers again, which movement simulates the TMS trigger finger movement to the motor cortex. So it's unclear, and then TMS can be applied to left hemisphere or right hemisphere in the double blind procedure. So sometimes the subject is asked to hear the quick sound and raise the hand, but sometimes it's triggered by the contralateral motor cortex stimulation, but sometimes it's just on spontaneous will, right? Because it's just controlled this way, this way. But uh, when so it's, this number of differences indicates that TMS in fact influences, but uh, subjects who are unaware of TMS and they reported that in a lot of cases it's actually TMS triggered, but they misattributed to their spontaneous, spontaneous will, especially when the motor onset is within 20 milliseconds from the TMS. So it's actually created by TMS. Your finger is just controlled by the TMS, but you feel like you actually did it for your spontaneous decision. Okay, so that happens a lot. So spontaneous will is a prospective construction and it's easily misperceived. That's the point. So it seems like, in some cases at least, implicit motor commands first and then motor cortical, cortical activity and then muscle movement. But then, uh, somewhere around this process, there's this positive process to perceive the uh, intention, a positive attribution to intention. Uh, so, number one reason why the neural reductionism won't eliminate the sense of agency is because the feeling of features may be mostly in positive process, not in the predictive process. The second reason is very important for me. The feeling of features is a matter of content in perception and cognition. It should not be confused with the deterministic nature of the neural coordinates. And you have to make a clear distinction between mind time and brain time. So what does this mean is this. Even if, so let me just give you an example that might be easier. So let's say this is the situation between uh, physical time, lower cortical level, and higher cortical level, and there's this re-entry signals. And this is just simulating a backward masking situation. So target presented first, immediately after a very strong mask presented. And at some moment, this uh, stimulus A has to be processed for several hundred milliseconds to reach the conscious awareness. But backward mask, uh, especially the entry part of that signal, stops or you know, confused with uh, disrupt the uh, processing. So uh, you don't perceive A, or you perceive A but very slow. So sometimes you have reversed order of perception, like B perceived first and then cause A. My point is the following. The neural process still, at this critical level one, for instance, is that A first and B second. But that doesn't constrain your co uh, content of perceived saying that B first and it causes A. In other words, neural sequence and deterministic nature of that sequence does not constrain the content of the cognition, the content of perception, such as B uh, occurred first and caused then. This is logically possible, yeah. right? But empirically. No, no, there are empirical evidence. So, yeah, the so, right. is, uh, so backward masking is one example. Reversed phi in classical motion. And there's the latest study 
10 years ago, I think, in the uh, motion in this blindness context, where the subsequent massacre is possible earlier. So there it is. Yeah, but uh, in most of the cases, I think that the integrated percept uh, over the time is uh, distinct from neither A to B, A to B or B to A. Like, let's say, uh, in the case of the backward masking, when you see A briefly and then followed by B, you do not see okay. B first and then A. Okay, maybe so. But my point is not about per perception of A is A, B, C, because of B, A, C, because My point is that, in principle, the content of percept can be independent of the deterministic nature of the neural sequences, which is the neural correlates. So A B example is just you know it's a very simple example, but it doesn't it's not limited there, and it may not work in the most cases of perception. But what I'm saying is that don't get confused. The perception of free will can be created by entirely deterministic neural sequence. That's what I'm trying to say. That's fine. And everybody's confused about that. <laughs> okay? So that's point number two. Uh, by the way, I don't agree. Then debate won't. <laughs> uh, one thing about Benjamin Lebel, I, I really was influenced by his uh, uh, ideas, and uh, you know, is highly related to these post diction ideas. One thing that was very peculiar about his case is that somehow he assumed only one time axis, and it's unclear whether it's brain time or mind time. And he's trying to say something like happening later in this time scale causally influences the perception of the stimulus, and uh, your perception of, of the onset of the pain, for instance, occurs at this time T. And this really, you know, raises lots of philosophical and religious arguments against, right? It's really confusing because future causally means the past. How could that be possible? Uh, don't worry about it, right? In my opinion, just uh, make a distinction between uh, neural time and uh, brain time and mental time, and then just assume that um, um, you know, your perception of that as a free action is just an ultra iconic memory, a very short term memory. Then there's nothing mysterious about it. There's no, nothing to go back. Right? And in most of studies, including his own psychophysics, usually the verbal report is given after at least one second or longer from the stimulus. So there's lots of time for perspective reconstruction. But they don't call it memory task, they call it perceptual reporting task. Right? So, point number two, again, so let me just repeat. Point number one, the reason why neural detection is more to eliminate the sense of agency of free will. Number one, feeling of free choice may live in the post process. Number two, the feeling of free choice is a matter of content rather than the neural code sequence which brings about. The final reason, which I also very much uh, fond of because I'm a visual psychophysicist, is that the feeling of free will is very much like a perceptual illusion in that it occurs in most neurotypicals and will not be eliminated by the objective knowledge. So what does this mean? Um, maybe I'll give you the example first. So subjective control physically doesn't exist, but it's very difficult to eliminate from your distance especially. And if you, have, you color this wedge, then you see this uh, semi-transparent uh, film-like redness in the middle. Of course, if you use a uh, colorimeter to measure the wavelengths, like there's no redness here, but your brain construction is very difficult. After knowing that there's no redness, you still see it red. And of course, the same applies to you know this mirror layer, or in this case, this is an um, example by Kanitza. You have black four squares behind the occluder, uh, black disks behind the occluder. The elements of the blacks are the same. <laughs> and you can very hard to uh, eliminate that. So there's a general rule in uh, <coughs> geometric illusions that perhaps 10 to 20 percent of the illusion can be eliminated by the knowledge. But even after you measure the actual length using scale here and here, you still see you know the differences there. <coughs> so in psychophysics, authentic uh, definition of body the illusion. This is a weird term, body delusion, is it body by body? But body delusion would be first almost all neurotypicals express it robustly. And if not, it's just like you know schizo's delusion or something like that. It's not delusion. Second, it reflects normal, not abnormal adaptive brain functions. It's very important. And third, 
uh, it's resistant against top down knowledge. Okay? So why is this important? So imagine the color perception, okay? I enjoy Cezanne's very colorful paintings. And if there's this excellent uh, neuroscientist came to me and said, well, you see colors only because your wave was activated on this. You know, here's the red selective neurons, here's green selective neurons, and stuff like that. Does my phenomenology, my criteria of this subtle color disappears? No, it's not disappearing. Right? I understand how it happens, but it's not disappearing. Let's say I have a toothache, tooth right? So I go to the dentist. This is a crazy dentist, and uh, combined with neuroscientists, he explained why my tooth is actually a painful. But he also argues that this is the illusion by the brain, and it's disappearing. Sometimes it disappears, but usually it doesn't. My pain is still there, regardless of the reductionism and neural reductionism. So it's independent. Phenomenology is independent of neural account. So what I'm arguing here is that here's a very peculiar, suspicious coincidence between visual illusion and sense of agency, or the feeling of free choice of reaction, because the sense of agency of free will usually satisfies these three criteria. Okay? So it's almost like free will is an authentic, valid illusion. And just like other geometric illusions, visually perceptual illusions, it's not eliminated by the knowledge. And in this case, the knowledge is the neuroscience knowledge. Okay? So even if it's explained out entirely by neuroscience, your sense of free will may not disappear. So I'm done, basically. Those three points are really the main message. But I'd like to have a couple of other so what post about, what about hypnosis? Huh? Hypnosis. Hypnosis, yeah. Yeah, so uh, uh, people lose the sense of free will. Uh -huh. uh, but I think it seems to be happening by top down knowledge. Yeah. Um, oh, I see. So maybe with that regard, that's inconsistent with my claim. But in a bigger picture, it's consistent, right? Because your subjective feeling of uh, sense of agency or free will is not eliminated by objective knowledge. Mm. So until you wake up and you are persuaded by somebody, that's you know that's consciousness. But until that time, your free will is still there. Yeah. Uh, is the people under hypnosis uh, usually report that they don't have free will? Yeah, like if they say like their hand is going to. Well, you're talking about post hypnotic suggestion. That's a different thing. Mm -hmm. So you know. So I. Give you hypnosis, and then I say, when I grab the hand later, you just bow and sit down and bow to me. And I just remove the hypnosis. And after 10 minutes, I grab the hand and you suddenly sit down. Wow. But even in that case, so this famous case by Freud, Zygmunt Freud and Krapalit, the neurologist, even in that case, I ask you, why are you doing this? And you create the reason. Or, you know, like I, found, I kind of left a dime on the floor yesterday, so I'm looking for it. Something like that. You create the piece. So it's really positive. Yeah. So it's consistent or inconsistent in a lot of things. But anyway, what I would like to say, uh, two more things I want to say. So you know, if you think about this uh, webinar earlier, multiple papers arguing from neuroscience viewpoint that free will is just a cognitive illusion, it's, it doesn't exist. So it's similar to what I'm saying. And he said basically people can experience conscious will quite independent of any actual caused, causal connection between their thoughts and actions. The impression that a thought has caused an action rests on an apparent causal sequence. In other words, they create kind of causality uh, by salient cues. So that's fine, except that uh, we emphasize the possibility of reconstruction. And these three criteria that uh, webinar named a uh, sort of typical phenomenology of you know, this phenomenal illusion of free will can easily be created by a post process. Another thing I really want to emphasize, and I think this is really a new idea, and I like to be very uh, provocative here, is that cognition can easily become perception. You, you, you don't understand what this means, but I told you that uh, in the social system history, free will is considered, uh, at least some, uh, by some as a predominant fiction in social system. So if it's the social fiction, how could you perceive it? And if you ask me, I know this fact, but still I have this feeling of rejoice. I have this feeling of choosing coffee versus tea. So how could this be possible? But if you think about it, like those X-ray experts 
can immediately pass lung cancer in several teens of milliseconds. That's been known. So, but for naive people, it's no idea. And even if you are uh, not well trained, then you have to make a cognitive inference based on visual cue. Right? So those two are different things. But if you do hundreds of times, thousands of times, if you have 10 years experience on this X-ray diagnosis, then it's immediately possible. So isn't this sense of free will something like that? It's culturally imprinted and trained by the social environment. So that's my new idea. So this is probably giving some points to sort of higher order cognitive reconstruction idea of the free will. And it's consistent with the social history, social legal system history. But I'm not sure how much I believe this. So this is just uh, uh, to uh, give you the seed for thinking. And uh, my, last, my last point is, forget about everything that I told you. <laughs> because I have a very strong argument which really solves everything without those details. And it's something to do with, and this is a long term, opacity of human knowledge. Probably I have to ask Tavis-san or somebody else, philosopher, for the right English word. But human doesn't know everything period, okay? And that really important in this discussion. Why? Because uh, how to understand leftover sense of freedom, okay? So, real science tells you that it's not freedom, but you still have this feeling of freedom. And I have no idea for after lunch today, I might choose coffee or tea. I have no idea now, but when that happens, I can choose. And I still have this feeling of freedom. How do you explain this? So one important thing is the positive human knowledge. And by this, what I mean is this. Of course, the first thing is different perspectives, right? Person A knows it, person B doesn't know. And this is something with famous philosopher's argument, uh, Frank Hortz, uh, over determination against free will. Do you know about this? So imagine you're a driver, there's a T-junction, you make your free decision to turn, make a great turn, okay? But without you knowing this car is broken, and the engineer knows, that the car cannot be lifted down because it's broken. It can make only right time. So this is called over-determination. He used this peculiar example to go against free will because if you think about it, in daily life, almost any free will decision is like that. Right? You think it's free will, but maybe some sort of physiology, a neurotransmitter balance, and your memory about how many cups of coffee you had, all those things pushes you to the T, and there's no freedom, but you have a feeling of freedom. Something like that. But that, that's uh, over determination uh, yeah. from the viewpoint of the outsider. Correct. Right? Correct. So from the course point of view, it's not over determination. Correct. So that's, that's, the, that's my point about opacity of the human knowledge. And that's my reply to uh, the author's idea about this hypnosis. So he is still subjectively free, even though objectively it's controlled. Right. So, and then you know, there's this impl implicit mind itself. Is like somebody else in your mind. And sometimes you don't know what the implicit mind is thinking. And there's the subconscious intention, is it existing or not, it's unclear, but it's possible. And then there's this different levels of description. So, for example, if you think about the um, freeway traffic jam, each driver has 100% freedom to do whatever they want, right? They can escape from the next exit, they can change the lane, they can even, if you are really, they are really desperate, they can, you know, hit the tail of the next car. You can do anything you want, but in the very macro dynamics, it can be described the best by liquid uh, dynamics terminology, and it's predictable, at least statistically. So there's di different levels of exclusion. But basically, what I'm saying is that human knowledge is not transparent, in the sense that once you set mathematical axiom, all the theorems are sort of like automatically determined, right? So uh, there's something uh, different here. And of course, most important opacity is about this past, present, future. And there's a correlative differences. And this is almost the final slide, but let's just give you some amusing uh, example. We often do not know the facts or information, and uh, even though it's available, and also it's possible to know at some moment later. So, you know, the, this present is very, very unique, distinctive point. And accepting present as a distinct point of temporal perspective, then any physical or mathematical theory is not having this may be irrelevant. Uh, this is sort of screwed up. What I'm saying is that this 
present as very distinctive point of perspective and then accepting opacity of the knowledge is necessary for any theory of free will. So this is mainly to you. <laughs> you agree on that. This is an amazing example. So this is, imagine that this is a folk tale, okay? So you, I think this, I learned this from a Japanese philosopher's book. You are about to take a flight. It doesn't have to be London Airport, but it happened to be. If the aircraft is in fate to fall and to crash, then no point to break for safety. Right? But if it's not, then of course there's no need to pray or anything. So imagine that the future of this aircraft is determined to crash. And if it's determined, then there's no point to pray. But if it's not, then also there's no point to pray, so there's no point to pray. Now, you accept this, most of you. Okay, fine, fine, hold on. <laughs> the next one is more interesting. So, an um, interactive prayer case. So, your son might have been on the flight which crashed last night. Okay? Last night. It's crashed. You don't know if your son was really on that flight. Is there any point to pray for his survival? If he was there and dead already, then there's no point to pray. If he was not on the airplane and his health was safe now, then there's no point to pray. So either way, no point to pray. Now my question is this, is this London Airport case and uh, interactive prayer case is well known in philosophy. Are they the same to you? Of course I'm saying it's similar. There are similar aspects and very different aspects, right? But uh, what I wish to say is that um, there's no paradox or issue in these cases assuming the opacity of human knowledge. And I listed several cases, but past and future is one important aspect of opacity. Uh, it saves value of prayer from this fatalism in this philosophical context, right? But what I really want to say is that this structure between religious prayer and fatalism is analogous to free will and neural determinism. Why? Because from a different perspective, neuroscientist says, no, 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 it's not your free choice. You choose T, and that was determined. But that, that's still, if you accept this opposite of human knowledge, and it's the perspective of your knowledge, it's fine to argue for free will. Right? So it's similar to what's going on. So this is another argument outside of this three reason why neuroreductionism does not eliminate free will. And I don't know how this is related or unrelated to those three reasons, but I'd like you to think about it. I, I think this is really related to what we have been discussing today, right? Uh, as a sort of intrinsic viewpoint or intrinsic Correct. information. Um, it really doesn't matter how other people know about the situation. It is for that person if and they don't know it, that's what you call as an opacity of the human knowledge. Yeah, and also in, related to the over-determination case, you know, do you accept multiple perspective, perspective in terms of knowledge and physical law and psychological law and neural laws? Do you accept personal perspective and object perspective? And they are overlapping to each other, stuff like that. I, on purpose, I organized my lectures to be very difficult to refute <laughs> but I want you to refute them. So I'm done. Oh, so, a question. Uh, so, so you showed a series of nice post-dictive things about the, the free will. But uh, do you have any comments on those classic Isaac Fry's paper or recent Dissimulger and, and Sirius paper where you have stimulated SMA if you give a stimulation to a, 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 a private cortex, people feel the urge to move off, like some kind of will to move. Right, right, right. So another point is, you know, is, is in your concept, uh, is free will is a learned thing or not? Uh, free will is learned or not? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So let me answer the second question. I think, so I'm so more and more inclined towards positive idea and cultural imprinting idea. Mm -hmm. So I think it's stupid to try to do some quantum physics measurement to measure the energy of consciousness because it's not there. That's my feeling. The first question is more interesting because I think it's something to do with what I call the paradox of the center of free will. So imagine, so what is the typical business of neuroscientists, right? So you do visual perception to try to find the center of visual perception that's sitting here. If you do auditory perception that's sitting here, 
if you do exactly the decision that's sitting here. So let's just find a neural center of free decision, free action. And you find it, then as you ask, do electric stimulation of that center, then you get you can trigger free action. But is this free action? I don't know. It's a matter of the free, free feeling of free will. So, so, so those patients, so, what they feel is, right. uh, is, is... So it's probably generating sense of agency a sense and of free sense will. of yeah. free choice. But in objective viewpoint, it's not free because it's constrained. So this is similar to Frankfurt case of all body time. No, no, no. So your point was basically saying everything is post-dicty, right? So, so you're saying that you know move, you make an action and you and there's a reasoning comes afterwards and you make reason for it, right? right. In that case, you know uh, the, the the first movement itself does not have any content, but you override the content coming afterwards. Right? No, that's not true. I think you need something uh, there. So there is. I'm a neuroscientist. 99% of neuroscientists are working on predictive process. Mm -hmm. And in fact, my paper says I am successful predicting 90% preference choice. Mm -hmm. So I'm endorsing that. There's something there, but it can be confirmed mm -hmm. or override mm -hmm. by positive process. So, so, so in, in a lot of cases, it's consistent with prediction. So, you so know, like your urge case, stimulation, electric stimulation, urge, I don't think it's 100% the case, but statistically significant. Sorry, I didn't get it. Sorry. So, if you stimulate, then you, you, their subject felt the urge to yeah. move. Yeah. But it's not 100% of the case, it's statistically significant. So, in some cases, there's some peculiar reason, the post-diction override or suppress. But in other cases, just prediction is confirmed with the post-diction to actually you know, have this urge of the actual action. So, in some cases, post-diction is consistent with prediction. In most cases, actually. In some other cases, it's not. And there's nothing mysterious to me. So, so, so you agree that there is a predictive component of free will? Also. Of course, but it should be shaped to create free will sensation by positive process. Of course, our action is all controlled by predictive process. But after your execution, it's very important things happen in your brain to determine whether you attribute this to your free will or not. So but the electrical simulation case, people don't move. They don't move. There's no movement. Uh, so they, 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 they just feel that. Uh, yeah, I feel like movement, right? Sure. So, I mean, depending on parameters. In the TMS case, actually, their fingers are moving. So you can change. You know, and in some cases, it's moving. Sometimes it's not moving. It's just neural parameter choice, and it's not very important to me. Uh, sometimes you can make it moving. I know the person says, so, 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 let me just clarify. So, sure. so when you say post-dictive, uh, uh, so, uh, you said that you did an action, you have something, right? So I was thinking that you were saying that some kind of feedback from your movement is coming back to the brain, yes. right? Yes. But in the electrical stimulation case, there's no movement. So actually, there's no actual movement happening, mm -hmm. right? There's no feedback. But they feel that they, they say that they, they, they want to move. So it could, be a, it could be a peripheral muscle tension that's perceptively detected, or it could be more central, but in central, I don't know what the signal is. But it's not just my problem, that's everybody's problem. Wait, wait a sec. Uh, I, I wanted to also uh, say one thing uh, before go, uh, continuing. Uh, there is a dinner uh, with uh, some of the speakers as well uh, after 6. Uh, so we, we will be leaving from here at 6 and uh, having dinner from 6.30 near Inage Station. Uh, and uh, we, I, I think we asked for the registration for that, but uh, is there anybody who wants to join? At this point, or are you all tired? I don't know. If you if you want to join, now let us. In this case, you cannot use prostitution. You can pay now. <laughs> free will. It's a uh, three thousand. Yeah. Uh, let let me know if you want it. If you if you want to join, as long as you have post. So he wants to say still something, right? Or are you done? Okay. Me? Yeah. No. Oh, I wanted to follow up with. So so there seems to be two ways you can be prostitution, right? So backward masking is post-dictive in the sense that the, the, the mask that happens after the stimuli modulate the already existing thing. So without a mask, you would still see something, but with the mask, you see something different, namely nothing in some cases. But in, in your post-dictive case, are you saying that the post-dictive component is always necessary? It seems to be that is his question. If, because it, there, there could be a view that both of you could be happy. You would say that the prospective component modulates your views or sometimes change things, sometimes doesn't. Mm -hmm. But without the prospective component, you can still have just a feed forward. So it's been my experience that if I have some very faint pain in my knee, 
it's related to my aging, so it's annoying. But I don't notice until somebody pointed it that I'm limping, or I hit something and I just sharp pain. And I realized that five minutes ago I felt the pain. It's really positive reconstruction of the memory, but there was the sense bottom of sensory signal there. I think it's a very interesting empirical question to override no signals, but create you know, this prospective sensation or cognition by entire prospective process. I think it's conceivable, but I don't see any evidence. Uh, again, again, again it's, it's not matching, right? So, so you do not realize about that. You do you do realize about the but you're objectively maybe limping, right? Yeah. So the so, so, case is basically saying that you know there can be a situation where where you you there is a signal that makes you feel that you have a movement or you've got to have a movement. Yeah. Right. So so the Hackman's point is whether so are you at the at the position saying everything is prospective, or are you at the position where there is a predictive signal of free will, but it can be largely overridden by the, the prospective process? So I think that's that's the point. Well, largely, you know, I'm not sure, but prospective process automatically it's always happening. That's my hunch. Mm -hmm. But it in most cases is consistent with prediction, so you don't notice. Mm -hmm. So let me just give you one example of experiment that I skipped. Me and uh, my postdoc, Pavlin Chess, had this uh, dots moving laterally in the screen for a millisecond, and you just have to judge whether the initial position or last position by moving cursor and click. Entirely simple uh, task. Uh, but I have one trick that there's uh, this um, rain dropping behind so that this trajectory is actually moving upwards or downwards depending on the background. This is in you know, a region. So the question is, you have very clear impression of the final position. Do you modify the initial position memory by this distorted uh, trajectory? That was the question. And it's really uh, very much biased towards being consistent with the trajectory. This is 500 millisecond memory. And subjects know in 50% of trials, they ask for the initial position. But still, this illusion is very strong. So by that, I will conclude that um, your memory is constantly updated to be constant, consistent with the online real-time coming in sensory inputs. And it's always happening automatically and you're not aware of it. But in this case, it's inconsistent because you know, experiment, as an experimenter, we come up with a trick. But in most cases in life, it's consistent. Positive, positive reconstruction is consistent with the prediction energy. Uh, shall I bomb here? <laughs> uh, against almost all neurosci neuroscientists, I don't believe the determinism. Or rather, I would say the determinism is a valid illusion. Okay. As a mathematical physicist. Okay. Yes. And uh, uh, first, we should um, clarify the several terminologies. For example, we should distinguish Causality and determinism first. Maybe you should come here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> causality and determinism first. Causality means that uh, without, uh, A is cause of B, means uh, without A, no B. It means. So, in the Libet's experience, if I am the, uh, in the experiment, I, I should play with the experiment, for example, and uh, you can move the, you can intend to move the finger, and, but also I can intend he, here, or you, you can ask other people something. So even if there's such kind of motor, uh, precision, uh, pre, uh, pre, uh, motor, uh, is yeah, yeah is uh, necessary, but it is logically not the sufficient condition. Yeah, and that's, that's the same case as Libet's uh, argument about pitoing, right? Yeah. So you have an urge in the motor cortex, but you can of course have freedom to stop. The problem is this logic is that by stopping you move this hand, this is also preceded by the neural cortex. That yeah, the, it did, that is the second thing. Uh, the, of course, there is, uh, by the reductionist point of view, uh, it's a similar, 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 but more is different. More is different. In general, I don't, I don't pa uh, want to persuade here because I have no experimental data or something, but very logical thing here. And uh, for example, 
the uh, determinism uh, is uh, uh, believed uh, in the common, uh, common um, belief in physicists or something. Uh, determinism is the very general feature of the na nature. And uh, only very, very microscopic uh, nature, for example, quantum mechanics, something is indeterminate. This is a common belief, a valid illusion, because not uh, many or the almost uh, the only cases of the total determinist works is the astron astronomy. For example, even in the f uh, fluid mechanics of something, stochasticity comes in. And they believe that the principle of the uh, equation is deterministic and noise, external noise comes in, but it, it, it is just a belief. And in such cases, the system itself is determined by the perturbation from external is the such kind of belief. But about for the brain, the brain has internal, internal noise. If you define the self, including such kind of in, uh, noise, in, in, noise in that system, then this uh, becomes stochastic, stochastic itself as a physical system. So determinism in principle does not uh, uh, apply such cases. Uh, so, 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 here, so, so disagree with that. My, my interpretation is that you, you certainly draw a bomb, but it's in favor of me because I have three reasons why neural determinism does not eliminate free will, plus one additional yeah, reason, yeah. which is opacity. But you add even more safeguard, yeah, yeah. saying that so, first of all, reduction is determinism itself is illusion, so don't worry about it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, determine, I think there's lots of problems with determinism, and I agree with you that uh, you know, there's noise uh, inside and outside of the brain. One thing that I might want to add is that a lot of people assume that free will is against determinism. And you know, in the human beings are very hard to predict. And they have free will. That's why you know determinism cannot cap capture. But being random by noise is not necessarily what I do think about the free will. So there's a distinction between being random versus being having based on free will. Right? Yeah. Another thing I want to say is that I think this I'm just talking it, but in the at least in the empirical tradition of uh, uh, causality. Uh, the prerequisite for causality is that event A and event B can be separately identified. Otherwise, you cannot talk about causality. But in the intention action relationship, intention is almost impossible to identify without seeing the action. So, this doesn't satisfy the prerequisite. So, various reasons applying the causality to action is already hopeless from the two stages ahead of time, before I argue for three reasons. But, Dr. Sama, any other philosophers would like to uh, influence us? Or any other point? Uh, yeah, maybe. usually I think that I will answer point of the mechanism was quite the controversial, I think. I mean, I, I, I believe that physics is deterministic, or I like to think that, I think. But I see no problem either. I mean, I, yeah, I don't really see what the prompt was. I mean, if, if so, if and we, of course, the brain, since we don't know the external state, the brain is kind of indeterministic, mm -hmm. even if the whole universe is deterministic. So I don't I, yeah. I kind of. Uh, so what I, I, uh, here the point is the methodology of the determinism is uh, not necessarily uh, suitable for the purpose for the for example new, neural science or something. So um, it is not the idea that, that, that as a methodology. Yeah, with, with this, I, even as a determinist, a like complete determinist. Uh, but. Uh, uh, I I don't believe the the world is completely determined. The de determined, yeah. but uh, as a, for example, the uh, asymptotically or the some approximately determine, deterministic phenomena is of course present in here and here or something. In for example, like a ball. But uh, 
uh, throwing the cat is a little different, for example. <laughs> throwing a ball and throwing a cat is a little different physical phenomena. And uh, throwing a cat is not so much deterministic and uh, not suitable for the such kind of deterministic description also. I think the point about opacity is the clearest way to think about this. So if you go beyond the opacity of human knowledge in general, when you have a physical system, whether it's deterministic or not, at any given point in the system, only so much information is available to other parts of the system. So it's really not whether the fundamental underpinning microscopic blocks are deterministic or not, it's whether or not the thing that is important to the level of theory you describe has yeah. over-complete information or under-complete information about itself. But uh, information, of course, you can uh, consider about the level of information, the cost grain. You can, in, in such cases, the casticity arises. But it is not the only case. For example, intrinsic casticity. And uh, we cannot uh, distinguish uh, in the, yeah, yeah, the same system. But, but it, it is, the, how to say, the, uh, depends on the methodology or something. What's overcomplete? information. Well, how does it work? Does it exist? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so if you, if you had something like, um, no matter what, even if you add noise in, uh, when you coarse grain, it always goes to a predictable state. So it turns out that actually to, to determine what you need to know about, you don't need to know anything because it only has one solution. That's kind of what I was thinking. So like the a lot of statistical systems go to equilibrium, and you can do all sorts of things to make them different from each other, but in the end, if you wait long enough, all of it doesn't matter, and you didn't need to know anyway. You can still predict it without knowing anything. And that's kind of the reverse case of you need to know more than you have. Um, I don't know that it's really applicable to the brain, which is really disequilibrium, et cetera, et cetera. But the last point we should uh, emphasize is the, the, to define the notion of causality itself is very controversial. Uh, it is related to, to your uh, view. And uh, for example, in the history of philosophy, for example, Hume argues about the uh, fundamental uh, problem of the causality. But uh, um, from my view, uh, our viewpoint, we uh, discussing with uh, Shiga, uh, Shiga Tabuchi san. And uh, uh, for example, the every Phenomena is very, how to say, it, very unique, not uh, reducible, very unique uh, phenomena. But uh, uh, to, to, to define or to establish the causality relation, we should have a prevalence class of such, of yes. such thing. So to def how to define the equivalence class of uh, uh, events is, uh, event is very important to uh, dis, uh, discuss the uh, causality. So, uh, scientific study is such kind of, uh, depending on such kind of uh, uh, structure. So, scientific uh, study of something be becomes causal and uh, uh, probably deterministic or something. But this, this experiment, which is related to the heart problem or something, cannot reduce the such a causality relation. So in such cases, a very phenomenological, philosophical thing and the scientific study of thing can be ultimately reconciled, <laughs> whatever happens. So this is the last point. Let me just uh, make sure that I answer. So um, in any science, you have to gross over the different small differences in the, uh, each event and you have to class them as, as the same. And then you can come up with this general problem. It, this is not, this is even true in the physical world, right? Now, you are saying that it's the same in the intention and action, but there's extra reason why, extra intrinsic reason why it's even worse in this case. Mm -hmm. Or are you just saying that it's the same as other uh, field science, which uh, I'm asking. Absolutely. So, 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 so people in physics, there's this problem of crossing over the minor differences in each event, yeah. and just you just class them in as an homogeneous, mm -hmm. and then you have just, you know this is a cause and always happening like this. Mm -hmm. Now the same applies to brain and action, intelligent action. But is there any additional intrinsic reason why it's even worse in this case? Even worse. What, what worse means that you know that you cannot predict. 
Having small yeah. problem man. Ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. Hello, yeah, yeah. somebody. Ah. No, no, uh, I don't mean. You're just saying that this is true in science in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's science in general. Really? So I don't have very strong views about any of this, so I'm not sure why I'm here. But, but I, I did my PhD on this topic, as some of you know. My, I used to work on this. So, so, the, so I, the literature I, I used to know was that there is an additional problem that is worse. Because here you're talking about a high-level phenomenon that, uh, namely conscious experience, which you suppose most people would think emerge from those low-level neuronal activity. So for that to be causal to back to a low level, this is called a downward causation problem, which is, I think, what now wanted to do this about. And that is a uniquely difficult problem. Uh, just because your causal, your, some people would say uh, from, from you know, decades of psychophysics and metaphysics, uh, I'm sorry, not, not met metaphysics and philosophy, people talk about the, ca the causal power should come from only the low level stuff. So your, your neuron cause, your neurons to fire, etc., etc. If that is the case, then the high level phenomenon of, of consciousness may be just going along for the ride, even though it's not a dualist view, just from the emergentist view, you, you would have this problem. Now. But there are even more, you know, other reasons why it's even more important because, as I said, people are looking at prediction period and talking about noise and signal, but what I'm saying is that the postdiction is also very critical, so they're looking at wrong places for even evaluating the noise or one thing. Of course, if you include the postdiction process, then that's better, but still, there's this, you know, border uh, example, and, you know, it's, it's so dynamic, and the brains are moving around in dynamically. One is dominant, teens of second data, the other is dominant, even in perception or anything. So that's even making it worse. So there are additional several intrinsic reasons why you know, this you know, causality has this pulling, uh, neglecting, grossing over small issues. That's a general problem in science. But a new sense of free action is worse for various reasons. Yes. about uh, the, your interpretation, interpretation of the direct experiment. So according to your interpretation, what is illusory is the sense of like uh, the decision of being really that. What is illusory is the sense. Of course, we have a sense of freedom or sense of agency, but in a sense, it's illusory. But I think there's another interpretation of it experiment. That is, what is illusory is just when uh, the decision is really done. So, you know, how about this? Yeah, I agree. And I didn't make a clear decision, but uh, uh, discovery of various potential argues for this determinism. So it's just one of the two kinds that you mentioned. The finding of backward referral. This is an entirely different experiment using um, continuous stimulation to somatosensory cortex and the evaluating the onset of the timing of the pain. This is an entirely different experiment. And this is arguing for the illusions only about the timing. Mm. So there are two different experiments with two different uh, significance. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So I, I feel like there are like two different issues in the discussion. So one is um, like uh, in Shin's talk, uh, the question was mainly about how we experience free will, not positively. So that, that's, uh, in that sense, uh, it's, it, uh, it's like asking the question of qualia in a way. So, but on the other hand, the like Saibo-san's point is maybe the physical reality may not be deterministic as we believe, yes. but, but then, uh, well, but I think what people are generally interested in the question of free will is whether our will uh, has any ability to make changes mm -hmm. in this yes. uh, undeterministic yes. world. So do you, do you see uh, this kind of uh, possibilities or, or is free will completely illusion? No, I, I think I agree. That's, uh, that's actually why I kind of left my 
PhD work there, it, it seems that the, the critical question actually isn't so much about these lipid experiments per se, because in a sense that explaining the, the illusory feeling of, of free will is, I, I entirely agree with, with uh, Shimujo Sensei, in fact, I have done some of the study, I can send you reference. We have shown that using TMS we can create exactly this kind of restrictive situation in the bed setting, so we can retrospectively change the, the bed report of W. So I, I'm entitled with you, and, and at the same time, I'm also entitled with you that, yeah, the world, whether it's random or deterministic, may not be the, the real question here, it, it is, and it's not something so trivial that we can just easily say, but the, the question seems to be whether consciousness has any causal power to action, right? So that was the question I was referring to, and, and philosophically, it, it, it is not trivial, um, I don't have much to say, but there is one philosopher called Neil Levy, and he has written a book called Consciousness and Free Will, I think, actually. So the idea that he had, I think, was quite possible was the, the notion of, there really the, the distinction between phenomenal and access becomes useful. So most of us in the field, we're interested in phenomenal consciousness, because that relates to the hard problem, and that's what really drives the whole field, the subjective experience. But when it comes to action, it seems to be quite obvious that access consciousness would be the notion that relates, right? So if you have some experience that is only phenomenal, you feel the, the redness of red in the red light in when you drive a car, but you did not have any access to that, then obviously you, you can't quite control your action accordingly and you might crash. And in that case, it's hard to say that you are responsible for that. Yeah, so the, and related to that, I, uh, I uh, discussed with uh, Antti Leonso, um, you know, who is uh, studying the dream, dream in uh, Finland. And he thinks that uh, some cases of the vivid dream can be considered as a sort of the uh, potential way to you know, find this downward causation, like consciousness causes something physical. Now, uh, like, you know, if you have a particular dream that changed your life, you know, your course of the actions, you know, upon awakening, but if the content of the dream can be realized by many different kinds of neural activity, then in that kind of case, there can be a case when you consider contents of the dream, contents of phenomenal consciousness as the causal you know, power for the subsequent act uh, uh, activity might be more parsimonious than considering a set of different possible kind of neural activity that jointly sometimes you know, probabilistically determine contents of consciousness and then that um, changes the cause of action. So that, that's a really weird kind of possibility, but I this, think... This is very interesting. So I think we should uh, refer to the literature of placebo, right? Mm -hmm. So as you may know or you know, placebo turned out to be real in the neurophysiological sense. So if you give uh, anti-Parkinson drug and you measure the floating dopamine in substantial nigra, uh, it's increased in the patients the same way as drug responders brain does. And uh, D2 receptor, I believe, if I remember correctly, uh, is substantially uh, activated just as response to the drugs. So it used to be believed that placebo is just um, like a psychological expectation effect and it's illusion. But in, even in the receptor level, it does have this vigorous effect. So is placebo real or not? But why am I mentioning placebo? Because a lot of people take placebo as evidence for strong dualism in the sense that mind influences brain rather than brain influences mind. I disagree, but what do you think? It's kind of an important question. Yeah. It's probably the way to define or operationalize causality, I think. Um, and also, as you say, you know, to define what uh, kind of unique events as unique or distinct, you know, uh, depending on the way you categorize this, you know, brain event or phenomenal event. If we, um, you know, categorizing set, uh, sets of the expectation of uh, conscious experience of the you know, drug as more parsimonious explanation of the subsequent, you know, uh, action, including the receptor effects and so on, then that might be better uh, candidate for the causal explanation of you know, all these things, rather than going from the bottom up, you know, uh, you know, receptor level explanation. 
I fear that I'm going to ask the same annoying question, but you now you also start. Uh, it's the same boundary question that, that I think interests me, and I think that's what ultimately would drive the empirical research in the field. It, do we know that there are no unconscious placebo, or do we know anything about this? Unconscious. Unconscious. If there's unconscious placebo, then maybe this is not a unique problem uh, to mind. At least the vast majority of placebo literature is requiring conscious awareness. Uh, Usually, I don't know yeah, if there's one ex ex exception yeah. or not. I have so what, what comes as placebo? What about like subliminal priming? Is it a kind of unconscious placebo? So in the in the uh, psychoimmunology literature, the, the, some classic work about uh, they, they actually phrase it in terms of conditioning. So they were not talking about uh, placebo in that case. They were saying that you can have stimuli, like a taste of something that that uh, condition your psycho autoimmune response. They if you, if you think about it, it's kind of like the same thing as placebo, it's just a different culture in that field. They've been calling it a conditioning, and this conditioning then, quite obviously, you can have subliminal conditioning, right? And, and why is it important for you? I mean, if, okay, let's say that's subliminal placebo, then? Then, then it means that this is not a unique property of, of I consciousness. consciousness. Yeah. I, I think that in this field, uh, it's something related to what we talk about with coffee break. If we, if we try to start everything from first principle and try to derive an explanation for everything, this is probably, I feel, the, the excitement in this cohort. This is the first time I attend a meeting like this outside of Tucson. Uh, <laughs> the, the qualification might be important. But, uh, but the, 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 the issue is most of the basic empirical research doesn't quite start this way. I'm, I'm not trying to defend the status quo and say that this is, has to be the way it's done. But at least knowing what's the status quo is useful if you want to do better than the status quo. And the status quo in doing this kind of biomedical science, usually you try to identify the boundary cases, right? You, you try to identify the necessary and sufficient conditions. So we have to wrap up in uh, 10 minutes, and I'm well known for breaking the uh, 10 minutes. But maybe I just want to say one thing. But I realize that Hartman is trying to say something about it's not specific to consciousness. The same thing happens in unconsciousness. That reminded me of my understanding of subliminal perception literature. I didn't review it in the last 10 years, but when I did it last time, I realized that the dominant theory is not going for the dichotomy between consciousness and subconscious process and try to find neural correlates of uh, conscious memory versus unconscious memory or conscious attention versus unconscious attention. Because each time you do that, it doesn't work. Very, very faint evidence in your mind. So the dominant opinion in this subliminal visual perception literature is that what's called subliminal perception is usually a piecemeal conscious perception. Or, in my opinion, it's a conscious at one time but then forgotten. Or by obscured by post-dictive cognitive reconstruction, stuff like that. So that really is voting for this continuum idea of subconscious versus unconscious. And the most of governments, including Tucson and everywhere else, has this uh, trap where everybody is falling in that consciousness is one thing, subconscious is one thing. Since phenomenology is so much different, if you go into the brain, there's very, very strong distinctive differences in your recordings, which is turned out not to be true. Right? You agree? Yeah, I think, I think that's right now, actually. In fact, that's nicely helped me to summarize where I stand about this. So, I, I used to be, I used to work on this problem of free will, that, that was my PhD dissertation. I, I still did it in my postdoc. And the reason I ended it exactly this problem, because when you compare conscious and unconscious, you end up having this confound, because in order to render something unconscious, you weaken the signal, right? You knock it out, and you mask it, or you, you drug up people. So you always have, you, you end up running the danger of comparing a big signal versus a small one, which actually in turn explains why I'm in Japan. Because a few years ago, I came to a conference and Mitsuo Kawata-sensei presented work using decoded neurofeedback, which then I saw as the great promise. Because there you have a way of getting people to use neurofeedback to induce fairly strong neural representations in the brain that is entirely unconscious. So at this point, we have data that is yet, uh, yet published, uh, but basically we can decode the representation of everyday object up to 90% correct and people are completely unconscious. So I think that will be the kind of promising empirical value because you can have strong and conscious representation that you can compare it against normal conscious perception. Well, last word. That's, that's the last. Uh, so my axiom, 
the first axiom or the third axiom is future is open. <laughs> and we can change the world. <laughs> yes. <laughs>